All right, welcome back to the Van Halen Roundtable here at Sunset Sound. I'm Drew Dempsey. I'll be your moderator this afternoon. I'm here with a man who needs no introduction, Mr. Juizel Zappa. Sir, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. I am a big fan of your new podcast, Running with the Juizel. Oh, thanks. How did that come to be? Well, you know, it's uh, it's something that was talked about for a while from Premier Guitar because they've been doing a bunch of podcasts with different guitarists on different topics. And, you know, I've had a, a, a history of, of being a huge Van Halen fan, so the topic of Van Halen is always interesting to guitar players because he was just such a monumental force yeah. in the world of guitar playing, in the world of music and everything. So uh, the idea of being able to have different guitar players talk about why Edward Van Halen was so important to them, maybe share stories where they had maybe met with him or, or worked with him, or just hearing the first time they ever heard the music, hearing it right from that guitar player, guitar player perspective of, of understanding like what clicked. Hey, the phone needs to be turned off. So professional. Uh, but the, being able to hear from uh, known guitar players and hear about what that influence is, yeah, that was of interest. So... Um, Premier Guitar had said, hey, would you want to do something like this? And we figured out what the the things that we thought would be exciting for people to hear about. And we started having some people um, uh, get booked to, to be on it. And we had no idea that uh, that there was even the chance that Ed wouldn't be around, you know, because we yeah. had the hope that we'd be able to share all these stories with Edward, and um, and then hear more about his own personal journey, and really kind of find out where he made that that big leap, uh, because there was a period in time where he wasn't doing the tapping, and of course that's one of his most signature things, but that's not the most important part of his playing. That's one really cool looking thing, and it's a cool sounding thing, but his rhythm playing, his songwriting, and some of his other characteristics in his playing at a certain point, and I don't know when it was, maybe late 76 or somewhere in 77, he just jumped to a whole other level from what he had been doing and, and the tapping became part of it. And it would have been really great to, to see if that could be pinpointed to, to find out like what, what clicked, what made that happen. Yeah. You know, and so that was something I would have loved to have been able to talk to him about. I'm sure uh, a lot of fans would have been interested to to hear. Uh, but stories like that with musicians that that are so groundbreaking, that do something that is so intrinsically uh, part of their personality, but it just comes through them. These are things that don't happen frequently in history. <laughs> you know, so to be able to capture and hear from the source, like, how did that inspiration come and how did it happen, you know? It, that's the kind of thing where it just needs to be passed down. When it can happen with certain musicians and they can share that kind of story with with people, it's important to, to know because that's a whole generation when music was a thing more powerful than it is now where people were motivated and they were so connected by music as a, a, a force in itself. Like you, if you were really into music, you were wired to be into music and you just had to be part of it. You had to do something. And whether you were going to have commercial success wasn't the important thing because you, you hear from people time and time again who were some of the biggest innovators with things, they were going to do it regardless. Yeah. They were just going to do it because they that's what they, they live for. Yep. You know, and... These days, things are so much more motivated by how many likes you're going to get or how it's going to look than how it's going to sound, you know? And MTV probably is one of the biggest things that changed how people related to music. You know, sure. they started hearing with their eyes. Yep. And so bands became more, you know, visually uh, focused. When As did it, MTV first break? Was it like seventy nine? No, no, it was in the eighties. It was, oh, it, was uh, in the 80s? it was probably 
83, 84, okay. yeah. uh, something like that. When it actually went live, I would have to consult the internet to find out. But it was it was early 80s, um, and they didn't have a lot of material that they were playing back when it first started. I mean, the, I think the very first video was The Buggles, Video Killed the Radio Star. Yeah, it was. I remember you know? that. And, uh, but see, you couldn't have a band like the Buggles now that would ever be, uh, popular just out of the gate, you know? Well, you had, uh, I, I wanted to mention this later, but you had, uh, one of my favorite music videos, uh, my guitar. Wants kill, to kill your mama. <laughs> wants to kill your mama. That video is sick. That Man. video was made by Jeff Stein, who had done a lot of videos, uh, in the eighties. He did that, um. Tom Petty one that was the, like the Alice in Wonderland style oh, yeah. uh, and he did a bunch of other ones but he was also the guy who made the Kids Are All Right the Who movie really and so he just has this rock and roll sensibility but the the goal with that video was to make it like um one of those 50s uh-huh. uh like like a movie that is exploited youth you know like youth gone bad kind of thing uh-huh. Yes. And uh, <laughs> and it was it was a fun video to make. It had a couple of guest appearances by um, different, Robert Wagner was Robert in Wagner was in it. In <laughs> fact, Robert Wagner was in uh, I think almost every video I ever made. You know, uh, but so that was good. But um, there was actually a pretty funny uh, uh, cameo of Michael Nuri, who was the guy that was in Flashdance, mm-hmm. and but he's. In in the video, I get thrown in jail, and so he's my cellmate, and he has a tattoo, like a prison tattoo on his forehead that says, I hate guitar solos, <laughs> and that's right when I start playing the guitar solo of the song, so he's, of course, very uh, ominous and in that And that moment. song was, uh, wasn't it Frank's song? Yeah, it was a cover that I did of my dad's song, so the original came out, I think, in 1969, which was the year that I was born. But um, the original version has some fuzz tone guitar and it has some other things on it. But later on in the 80s, my dad did sort of a, a not quite heavy metal, but much more hard rock version where he changed the riff a little bit. And my version that I did was more similar to that version. Yeah. But on tour, we play the original version, the the very first one from the Weasels Rip My Flesh album. We have a lot of questions, actually, about that that um, people want to know about for that album. Um, back to Van Halen, though, I think it's so uh, important. It's not people, you know, I think some people view this as exploiting Eddie somehow, but it's just everybody's saddened by it and everybody wants to know everything they can. And a lot of people have all this information. And going into 2021, why not share this with everybody, learn some techniques, learn some history, learn where they were standing in this studio, because if it doesn't happen now, when will it happen, you know? I think there's always going to be an interest in what Van Halen did as a band and what Edward Van Halen did as a guitarist. Of course. Because it just will always stand the test of time. But but when people are are sad about something uh, and they want to still stay connected to something, they're going to look for information because they're going to be interested in it. It's something that will help make them understand it better or connect with it more. So, you know, when people get a chance to talk about it or share stories or learn more, in a way, it helps people with the pain that they're feeling of the loss. Yeah. But everybody has to understand too that uh, as a fan, that's one thing, but, you know, the actual family members have their own experience with the thing. So there's, sure. there's a, 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 I think, an important uh, amount of space that can be, uh, you know, people have to understand. Uh, but it's, if if something is being done because it's for the love and the and the positivity of 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 this connection that everybody has to the music i think generally speaking probably everybody will recognize it for that and yeah. um and that's that's the thing you know it's it's just very difficult uh, to be in a world of 
drastic changes that we're experiencing, you know? 2020 is a hell of a year. And, and to have something change so drastically in the world of music like that is just one more thing that makes people just feel upside down. And that kind of brings us into reward music, which is going to be the wave of the future. It's your new platform that you started. It's simply amazing. It's five, maybe six of apps, platforms I use, all integrated in one. And this is where you find Running with the Dweezil at, right? Yeah, the podcast. Dweezilzappa.com. Yeah, Dweezilzappa.com is a reward music powered artist site. But reward music, if you just go to rewardmusic.com, you can see the video that explains what it is. And it's a little bit challenging to just give you a two sentence answer for what it is because, you know, the best I can do to give you the broad strokes of it is that it's a place where an artist can put all of their content in one place and make it easy for their fans to find it. But they, they can also reward their fans for being in this reciprocal relationship directly with the artist. Yeah. It's a permission-based uh, platform where artists directly have that relationship with their, their fans or the people that want to support them. And it creates a, a way better... Uh, ecosystem for the fans and the music because it's a curated experience. And at this point in time, if you're an artist who used to rely on touring for the majority of your income, I mean, what do you do? There's so many people that are struggling. I mean, a lot of people will see musicians as, as being, oh, well, that's first world problems. You know, oh, a musician can't work, you know, but there are a lot of people that, uh, you know, you might think they may be really successful, but they probably aren't anywhere near as successful as you might think financially. 100%. Uh, and that's, that's one of the things. Everybody is having a hard time in this time that we're, we're living in. But is, at least for musicians, the one thing that can help is if they can create that direct uh, direct relationship with the people that want to support them directly. Yes. So that's what we've done is just made it easier for that to take place. And uh, so if you want to get into it on a more well, we're going to come back to that, level, But I can. wanted to let people know that that's where they can find running with the Dweezil because it's so great. The one with Billy Corgan, who I'm a gigantic Smashing Pumpkins fan, and actually he tracked a door, which is a great album in this room. Um, it's all available at Reward, and we'll... That's right. In fact, today's episode, it, it, every new episode premieres Thursdays at noon, so that's moments away, I suppose. And uh, But today's episode is Blue Saraceno, and we're talking about women and children first. Oh, wow. But the, there's, a, there's a thing that happens in this interview, and I love stuff like this it, when it happens, when you hear some organic thing take place where... He tells me a story, and I I hear what he's saying, but then I have to pick it apart because part of it did not make sense. And as we go through it, we start laughing, but we just completely lose it. We we are we go off the rails, and it's one of those things that when you hear people that are laughing and it's, it's infectious, even if what the story was was not necessarily the funniest part. It's it's how it all devolves. Yeah. And there's a portion of this uh, episode that has that take place. And it's, I think people will get a kick out of it. I mean, if you're, obviously the content about the music is, is something that is fun and exciting too, but just that kind of thing where you are part of something that happens just in that moment, uh, it, that's the kind of thing that when it gets captured, it's so great to to live through something like that. Yeah. I know. It's amazing. Well, it just this is how this kind of platform has started. You know, we had Brad Wilk from Rage and Larry Lalonde from Primus and Mike Inez and Dean Del Rey. They were going to come in and just play a Van Halen song for our vault show where we take all this old material and have artists of today um, – play play one of the tracks in the studio and kind of recreate it. You know, there's a lot of bands and kids that come in here and don't even know who the doors are. And so it's like, let's, we were up in our vault, let's like, let's recreate all this stuff. 
well, those guys are going to come in. Then COVID kind of put us on lockdown for a minute. And hopefully we still do that, Brad, if you're listening. And then we're like, well, let's talk about, you know, the demos and this room in 1977, you know, the 25 tracks they did in two days and just went through 10 rolls of tape. And then it was like, well, let's talk about Van Halen 1 now. Now it's, you know, we have Ted Templeman coming in. We have Dreezel Zappa coming in. We have uh, Peggy McCreary, who was an engineer on VH1. All these people with all these stories. And it's just so fascinating that we couldn't encapsulate it into even Van Halen November, which we were originally doing. So it's going to be Van Halen forever. When people want to come in and talk in the room that all this stuff happened, you know, for the first five albums, then let's just do it. We'll tape it. And put it up, you know. Well, sharing commentary and opinions and stories and facts and things that you can look at and say, oh, right here is a work order that says they did this on that day. And here's the room and here's where it happened. And these are the kind of microphones that were used. There's There are people that love that kind of stuff. Sure. And then there's people that are like, well, you know, I just like the music. But the the thing about it is the the... The recordings themselves captured something really amazing and really important. And knowing that you can be in the location where those notes were ringing out, like my favorite album is Fair Warning. Yeah. And we're sitting right in the middle of the room where Fair Warning was played. So, you know, that doesn't ever get lost on me, that excitement. Like, I feel like this is so cool to be in this space. And obviously so many other things were done here. And when I got a chance to record in here, I didn't even know at the time that part of my dad's album Hot Rats was done in here. Majority, yeah. Yeah, so when I'm, <laughs> when I'm sitting in here, I'm like, oh, my God, that record was dedicated to me and it was recorded the, when, the year that I was born. And so, you know, there's, a, there's an amazing sense of history. And what you guys have as Sunset Sound that perhaps a lot of other studios don't have is that incredible history of, I don't know how many gold records, how many platinum records Over have come out of here. yeah, gold. So, so you have music that people have had major life experiences with, exactly. good, bad, everything, but it all was created in here, and music has that ability to be a time machine and attach itself to your your memories, exactly. you know. So, but what you have as the as the studio is the ability for future artists to be able to come in and have a little bit of that magic, the little bit of the fairy dust of all of that, just knowing that you're here and the 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 sound, the notes are still hanging around there. Like we could physically be walking through these notes and not even know they could still be here in this I building, you know. <laughs> it, but you could That's be so here true. and you could make your own new music. You could do live broadcasts from here. You can do things that have whatever you want to call it, the mojo, the magic, yeah. that, that thing. And as a musician, who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want to be able to be able to have a little bit of that history? And it's amazing that this place has been doing it since 1960 and is still at the forefront of creating very well-known recordings, popular music, and the details and all that stuff. Yes. You know, it's never going to wear off on the people that really, truly love music because there is no other place. Like, there may be a handful of studios in the world. I mean, you can think of uh, Abbey Road and, and some of these other places that, you're well, that are well-known to even a general music fan that they know the name of a studio. Yep. But... And we're independent, you know, we're yeah. independently owned. We're not like even some of those studios that you do know have 20 partners, corporations, all these people involved. Yeah. You know, this is a father-son recording studio, and it's just the magic because people want to come, like you just mentioned, yeah. where all this magic is, and maybe it's going to still rub off on them or if anything, they can get a good Instagram post. Yeah, and it's not just <laughs> rock. I mean, you know, Prince recorded it's, here. Yeah, you have all kinds of different artists that have been in and out of these studios. Celine Dion, Whitney Houston, Michael Jackson. I mean, everybody. It's, everybody. Yeah, it's crazy because – if you are a fan of that stuff and you've heard these records, to be able to walk through the room and, and see it and and just hear what your own voice sounds like in these places, 
it's just cool. I mean, there's, there isn't anything like it. It's almost like an amusement park ride, you know, because <laughs> if you're a fan of that stuff and you come in, this, this is a bit of a, uh, it's like an emotional roller coaster. You get to come in here and be like, oh, this is, wait, they did this here? This is so cool. And you walk down the hall and you're thinking, you know, Jimmy Page was standing over there or Eddie Van Halen or Joe Cocker or, you know, Prince or, so it's all this kind of stuff that, when you the the sum of all the parts it makes it unrivaled you yeah. know the, all the people that are that have done cool stuff in here and that's the thing is that w this is made to do cool stuff yep. you know <laughs> this isn't here to just you know do something that is not important this is here to just have people do creative yes groundbreaking innovative things and what other place is made for that? You know, people will talk about, you know, like jet propulsion laboratory or some other things, but this is, this is different. This is something like on a, a artistic human level that, you know, this is a laboratory for making the coolest stuff possible. Yeah. And it's just, it lives in here. You know, it's like, there's just an organism in here that breeds like success and creativity. And I've been in a lot of studios, but this place is just, you feel it in here. I don't feel it in those places for some reason. Maybe it's because I have such a close attachment, but I think Van Halen, you know, the year of 77, when they came in, they did the demos. Well, you know, they did the uh, show at the Starwood. Three months later, they're in here yeah. doing the demos. Three months later, they're in one doing Van Halen one with Templeman and just that whole process. And it was all in this house. And I mean, that really, when you love a band and have to be in a place where they did so much thinking and excess and fighting and loving and who knows, you know, it's just like, it's, yeah. it's, it's well, like a roller coaster ride. You yeah. Know it is. You there can keep is riding a, it every time you come in. There is a, a, a mysterious thing that uh, maybe you know the answer to. Ted Templeman most likely knows the answer. But when Eddie Van Halen played on the Nicolette Larson album, yep. which which year was that? Was that during Women and Children First or was that earlier? Uh, I don't know because it, it seems to me like it would have been uh, maybe earlier. But at th that time, you know, Nicolette Larson came in and sang background vocals on Women and Children First on Could This Be Magic? Yeah. So – that would make sense that they would have maybe just brought a reel of tape in because Ed's guitar was already set up and said, hey, just put a little bit of guitar on this thing. But I don't know. It sounds it sounds like the, the tone that he has on there is uh, not from the first album. It sounds like it's a later sound. So I don't know. Maybe you know. Well, that's kind of the stuff we're going to be doing on Reward Music. I mean, we're going to go up in the vault and just investigate work orders, and it's like, okay, we got something to package up. Let's announce it, and let's talk about it, you know, and have a live chat going, and everybody can, you know, be involved. But uh, Brian Kehu was just telling us about something about Nicolette, how they did that. I think, well, Ted obviously orchestrated that because he produced both those albums. Yeah. And, well, Ted will be in, and... Uh, I don't want to announce a date, but he'll be in soon, within a couple of weeks, a week or two. And That'd be got cool. a lot of information to pull from him and, um, you know, for him to come back to home base here and kind of wrong our rights. And, uh, you know, also Ed said that they did Van Halen 1 in seven days. We have work orders for 33 days. So we're really wondering, like, what was that all that, all that about, you know? And it's, it's not mixing for that long because we have every day where they'd mix and when they would do the live tracking. So um, these are going to be a lot of great stuff that we're going to start re releasing on our reward account. And, um, you know, it's going to be like a little Sunset Sound network, you know? Well, Always. that's the thing. Anybody that wants to, as an artist, have a place where they can broadcast all of their stuff, whether it's live or archive videos, uh, or they want to create content that can be subscribable or pay-per-view and uh, as well as all of their free content, you can do it all in one place and mm -hmm. make it easy for people to find. And then if you're a fan and you're supporting a band or let's say a studio by checking out their content, the stuff that you can do as a fan just by commenting or opening emails or uploading pictures or being part of a community and talking with other people in groups, you start building your own set of reward points, which then makes whatever things you're interested in purchasing, the price goes down. 
So it's all reciprocal. Just by doing what you would do naturally, everybody knows if you like something, the first thing that you're going to do is tell somebody. If you ate food that you really liked, you're going to say, hey, this was the best pasta or this was the best uh, birthday cake I've ever had. Yeah. It's just natural. You naturally want to share that you had a good experience. And so if you put that in context to a fan who wants to support a, a, a band, you know, naturally, if you are supporting them directly and then you're telling more people, hey, come here and support them directly, that kind of thing is the most important thing that fans can do and the, the best way that artists can connect with, with people because it's that organic, natural thing of, you know, hey, this is great. I love it. Check it out. Yeah. And it's, you're not doing anything that you wouldn't do naturally. Yep. And that's the whole point is that it just, it, it, it should feel that if you like something, you just, you're excited by it and, and yeah. why not share that? Well, we need to start supporting artists again, too, in any way we can. I mean, don't buy a cup of coffee for that day and buy a track. You know, don't buy a pack of cigarettes. I mean, the amount of money that people waste on such bullshit. And it's like, as we were talking the other day, you know, it's like uh, people will spend money on a Snapchat filter, but they won't buy the new Kings of Leon album for four ninety nine or something. You know, it's it's it's, it's weird insane. how that works, but I think uh, you know it got off base at a certain point with consumers having an idea because you see things like MTV Cribs where people have you know, Rented these houses, houses. <laughs> but they're not. You know, a lot of that stuff is not real. You know, when you see people like there was the classic thing where Robbie Williams. Uh, was showing off living in this castle and yeah. then come to find out that it wasn't his castle and he got in trouble for filming in there. Uh, but people think, oh, he lives in a castle. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, th this kind of stuff that happens, you're seeing things and hearing things in the media that aren't real more often than you think. Yeah. So you get the impression that that people are, you know, incredibly successful some people, some artists really are, and a lot of them really aren't. And how many times have you heard about artists being completely ripped off by managers, record companies, all that kind of stuff? Yep. So the more independent artists can build an audience of people that support them directly and that relationship is maintained just between the fans and the artists, the better. Yes. You know, but that doesn't mean it, for like a platform like Reward that if you were on a label that you couldn't work with the platform, it, it really makes it easy for a label and an artist to work together with the fans. And so there's there's a lot to it. If, if you're interested as an artist, check it out. If you're interested as a fan in supporting an artist who has a, a reward music-powered website, it's really, like, like we were talking about before, it's a great thing to be able to have that curated experience and a reciprocal relationship. So, I mean... At the end of the day, it's it's most similar to if you saw somebody playing a song on a street corner and they had their guitar case open or they had a hat there yeah. and you thought what they were doing was great, that's the closest thing you can have analogy, to supporting yes. an artist directly because everywhere else along the line, somebody's got their hand in the artist's pocket saying, yeah. oh, I'm going to take a piece of this and a piece of this and a piece of this. And so... That's what happens when they're signed to major labels and management and 100%. all these other things. There's always a percentage being taken. And uh, so, yes, it can work out well for artists, but it can also not work out well for artists. And that's why this is an important platform so that there's the power that can be put into an independent artist or even a label artist's hands to really create that uh, that that reciprocal relationship with the people that support them. Yep. And one more thing I wanted to add, and we're going to come back to Reward Music because I, I'm so excited about this. When you told me on the phone the other day about it, because I uh, am friends with Doug Ellen, and I told you Kevin Connolly has a platform for Juizel, uh, running with the Juizel if you didn't have something. You're like, oh, yeah. well, actually, I just started this. I was like, well, cancel that idea. This is <laughs> sick. But we're going to be offering live streams here at Sunset Sound where artists can come in, do virtual concerts, we can do it through sunsetsound.com or you can do it through your own website and integrate reward in. But we're offering that now. We have a full film team and it's just an amazing addition to what it should be here because it's 2020 going into 21. Everything's digital 
And you can. this is a platform where you can come in. This is a studio. You can come in and do a concert and broadcast to the world. And, you know, you just pay for the studio time. And that's one of the things that is really difficult to get people to understand is that in this point in time, when you're trying to put your best foot forward, audio really matters. When you're doing a live stream, if you're a band and you have a sound, you have a really specific sound, and you don't have access to create that sound for your audience because you're just doing it on your cell phone and you're going through Facebook or whatever, yep. what you're talking about is somebody can come in here record new music or record a live performance, have it go through the same kind of consoles and the same equipment that other amazing artists have been through, yet this will be your sound live to the people in a live stream with multi-camera shoots, and you're being able to offer that to people as a package. When they come in, they can have like a little mini documentary. They can have a live performance. They can have all this stuff because you have a film crew and you have the ability to go live anytime with yep. whatever you're doing. And, you know, as a fan, if something like this existed back in like in the <laughs> 70s, like what if Sunset Sound had this back when Van Halen was recording? You could be a fly on the wall for those kind of sessions uh. and stuff like that. I mean, this is the kind of thing that if you're a fan of a band and they have a chance to present something like this so you can see how they're recording, what they're using, see it happen in real time yeah. and have a, a live performance of something. I mean, it's the craziest thing that technology is being able to offer, but done the right way, it can be one of the coolest experiences for a fan and a band connection. It's just amazing. It's at rewardmusic.com. And um, we'll definitely come back to this too, because I want to discuss even more elements of it. But uh, regarding Eddie and your 40 year long friendship, and I know you've told this story so many times, but your first interaction with Ed was when he called the house, yeah. the Zappa home mm -hmm. and said, is Frank there? <laughs> well, so here's the thing. Uh, I was 12 years old. I, I grew up hearing only my dad's music, uh, as a kid and, whatever he was working on or whatever he was listening to uh, when he wasn't working on his own music, I didn't hear the radio really. So at 12 is when I started hearing some other music and I started to hear like the Beatles or Led Zeppelin or ACDC, but I heard Van Halen and I was stopped in my tracks. What so, track? Uh, well, the very first thing I heard was Eruption. Okay. But the, the album that was current at the time was Fair Warning. So I went and I bought... Uh, Fair Warning, I bought Van Halen 1, I bought Van Halen 2, and Women and Children first. But I jumped in to the most current record, and that has long been my favorite one ever since, you know, Fair Warning. So uh, the, the sound of his guitar, I would say, and it was probably right here in this room, who knows, it could have been right where I'm sitting, the, the G chord he plays on Mean Street, that is the, the greatest G chord ever played in the history of rock and I'll fight anyone who <laughs> wants to disagree with me because it is the, the most powerful, most aggressive, most rock and roll guitar chord I've ever heard, hands down. And so if I just want to just get energized and hear anything that makes me want to have that feeling that I heard, that I felt like when I first heard that stuff, I can put that on and I go right back to being that 12 year old kid that goes, oh my God, this is amazing. Yes. Now I had heard a lot of guitar because my dad was an amazing guitarist and I had seen him play live many times and I watched what he would do. But when I saw it, I thought this is so complicated. One day I'd love to be able to do that. But I knew that you had to know a lot about music to be able to do the stuff that my dad was doing. But when I heard Van Halen, it was so compartmentalized to be so guitar specific that even though I, I couldn't do what I was hearing, I knew that I could learn to do it and I knew I wanted to do it. And that was the thing that happened. So I was, I was super excited about guitar and Van Halen's guitar playing. And so out of the blue, somebody calls the house and says they're Eddie Van Halen. Now at this point in time, you don't have a frame of reference. You don't have 
MTV or, or social media or anything where you can see what musicians look like other than their album covers, their liner notes, or maybe some pictures in a magazine. Maybe you could hear them on the radio doing an interview. I had no reference. And the only reference I had that could have possibly, in my mind, been Edward Van Halen's voice is when you hear in the song Unchained, come on, Dave, give me a break. Wow. Yeah. Now, that was probably Ted Templeman. But so I'm only thinking as a 12-year-old, could that be Ed? I don't know. And so my mom picks up the phone. Would musicians call the house all the time? No, not really. Okay, it wasn't like every day someone else was calling, trying to get in touch with Frank or the, no, the family I mean, and the label. And, and he, quite honestly, was not a very um, social person. My dad was working on his own music all the time, and he would have people in his band or musicians he was using to play on his his tracks. That was about the the most social he would be, is, is if he had people that he was bringing into his environment. But he didn't he didn't really have like a group of friends where he's like, Hey, let's hang out this weekend. That yeah. just wasn't a thing, you know? So to have this random call, my mom was like, oh, some guy saying it's Eddie Van Halen. And, uh, <laughs> she's like, get on the other line. And this was back in the day where you could have like a phone that was on the wall and then another one in another room and you could press a line and yeah. pick it up and listen in. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I think it's him. Anyway, my dad <laughs> gets on the phone. They talk for a few minutes and 15 minutes later, he's at the house. Wow. So he just shows up. He's in, in the, the, I've told this story a lot of times, but he's in the women and children first jumpsuit. And he's got his uh, necklace on that has the Van Halen logo. And he walks up the stairs and he's got a purple guitar with two humbuckers. Now, I'd never seen him with a guitar that had two pickups in it before because I was used to seeing the, uh, you know, the guitars that had just the one humbucker. Yeah. But it's a purple guitar, two humbuckers. And he's got a piece of black tape that's over the headstock. Whoops, sorry about that on the mic. But over the, the headstock. And so after saying hello, within seconds, it was, hey, could you play Eruption? And could you please <laughs> play Mean Street? And so he plays all this stuff and I see it up close. And it was burned into my mind because now you can go on YouTube and you can see any number of videos, some of him playing it or other people trying to teach you how to do it. But as a kid, we didn't have that. You just had the record. You had the needle that you had to keep placing back or you had a cassette machine that you rewound. We didn't even have a way to slow it down and keep it in pitch. If you slowed it down, it changed the pitch. Yep. You know, so we were you know, at a disadvantage when it came to trying to learn this stuff. But at the same time, we were living in this music so much. We were thinking so hard about what it is. When you were trying to learn something, it meant so much to you, you know? But anyway, I saw that stuff up close and it made such a huge difference. And it was a, a, a really crazy thing to find out recently. And I, it, it was when I was talking to Steve Vai on one of the podcast episodes, the first episode, yeah. we talk about this because Steve Vai was in my dad's band uh -huh. at that time. And uh, Steve had gone to an Alan Holdsworth concert at the Roxy and Ed played with Alan that night and Steve had a chance to meet Ed, and they spoke for a minute, and he said, hey, I'm, my name's Steve Vai, and uh, I, I work with Frank Zappa, and if you ever want to meet Frank Zappa, uh, and uh, somehow he, he was offering an introduction to my dad. And so they exchanged numbers. Okay. And, but as a kid, I had no idea that any of that took place. I just knew that a call came in. But years later, I'm talking to Steve and find out, this is how this actually happened because Steve the next day was out, but his roommate answered the phone and Ed called and was saying, Hey, uh, you know, I met Steve Vai last night. He was saying he could hook me up with Frank Zappa. So the roommate gave Ed Frank's number and wow. Ed called. And then Steve, when he came home, the roommate said, Oh, Hey, uh, Eddie Van Halen called and was looking for Frank's number. So I gave it to him. And Steve was like, what? You gave, I'm going to be in so much trouble. And so a few minutes really? later, wow. a few minutes later, <laughs> the phone rings and it's my dad calling for Steve. And my dad would call Steve Sport. Hey, Sport. And he says, hey, Sport, Eddie Van Halen's here. Come on up. Oh, wow. So I didn't that know Steve same came that night, day too. That same night. Uh, so Ed's there, Steve's there, my dad's there. Holy and we're God. sitting with this purple guitar that's passing around in a circle 
and we're all playing stuff. Now I'm 12, I can barely play, you know, but my dad's playing, Eddie's playing, Steve's playing. We're talking about all kinds of music and all kinds of different stuff. And in, in that moment, I knew that I only ever wanted to play guitar for the rest of my life. Yeah. You know, that was like, how could you not? I mean, sitting in that circle oh with goodness. that whole thing, you know, it was insane. Was, was there any tape machines going? Uh... No tape machines at that time, <laughs> but uh, it was not too long after that that um, two other things happened, which I still don't know how they happened. Uh, one, I was playing in a, a school talent show uh, and me and my friends, we were playing Running With The Devil. And we're 12, just barely being able to play. I, I'd been playing guitar for about eight or nine months. You know, so we're playing Running With The Devil. I don't know how this happened, but Ed actually came to the sound check at my school. And my guitar wasn't staying in tune. So I said, wait a minute, I'm going to go back and I'm going to get you a guitar that will stay in tune. So he left, drove to his house, came back with this star-shaped guitar. It was a Kramer that was like a cream color with an orange lightning bolt. And, uh, and it had this Rockinger tremolo, which was pre-Floyd Rose. And uh, so it was a locking nut. And uh, anyway, so now I'm playing this brand new guitar that I'd never played before that Ed brought down. And he's on stage with us while we're doing a sound check. And I was playing Running With The Devil incorrectly. He's like, hey, you, you gotta, you're playing it wrong. Let me show you. <laughs> And so the guitar is over my shoulder and he stands behind me and he does a pick slide and then he plays the chords, right? And he shows me where I'm playing it wrong. He goes, this chord has to be like this. And then you know, I, I see it because it's total guitar perspective. And then I, I was able to correct the mistake and play it. But this was this insane moment where he went home, he got the guitar, he brought it back, he showed me how to play it. And, you know, th this was blowing my mind, of course, and my friends and people in the school were like, oh, my God, Eddie Van Halen's here. This is unheard of kind of stuff to happen uh, in a school. But I don't know how he ended up there because not even my parents were at the sound check. So it was just this weird thing. So and then not long after that is when we did My Mother's a Space Cadet, which is the first song I ever recorded. And Eddie actually produced it with um, Don Landy. Don Landy tracked it. Yeah. And Ed produced it at the house. Yeah, and so they were never, uh, he wasn't allowed to be credited as uh, as the producer, so on the record it says DeVards. Now, I never knew what that meant, uh -huh. but I, I talked to Greg Renoff last night, and he said, oh, you know what? Um, Don Landy told me what that was supposed to mean. And I just learned this last night, but DeVards was a, a take on Edward's name the way that his mom used to pronounce his name, Ed, Edvard. Oh, wow. So Devard yeah. was the name that, and so I just learned that's the craziest thing to hear after. I mean, that's 1982 was when we did that. So, you that's know. so incredible. Totally nuts. So did Eddie stay for the, the show then also? He did not stay for the show, but Guitar he was there for, for the, you the day. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was the craziest experience. Uh, and then when he produced the song, I had no influence on that. It's not, I didn't ask him to do it. I don't yeah. even know how it came up. I think Ed had come over a few times because uh, my dad had built the studio at the house, which was called Utility Muffin Research Kitchen. And at the time, Ed was either in the process or was about to build 5150. And he was uh, talking with my dad about things that uh, he should be on the lookout for during construction yeah. and, and all that kind of stuff. So somehow or another, this was really early on in the, the building of Utility Muffin Research Kitchen as well. So what I recorded uh, was one of the very first things done in the studio, the thing that Ed did with me. So it was almost a way for my dad to, uh, to have somebody else work in the studio and, and see what the results would be and get some feedback from some people to say like, okay, what kind of problems are you experiencing in the studio? And I think that was like the test case. Uh, and then another one like that was a missing persons record was done right around the same time. It was, it was well before my dad even made his own recording in there because the first record he made was... Um, you are what you is in the studio. At the, um, at the house. Yeah. 
at Frank's house. Yeah. At Eddie's, gotcha. Yeah, so it was just a weird set of circumstances. But I was just a 12-year-old kid who would be, like, be giving this information, you know, oh, you're going to record this song uh, next week, and, you know, Ed's going to come in and help you out with it. And, That's you know, incredible. So me and my friends were freaking out over this, obviously. I think, uh, you know, obviously the being the greatest guitarist ever and also, you know, the fans being so upset, which, but him being such a nice person also, you know, and so many stories that he didn't have to come over there. He didn't have to come to your he uh, sure didn't. sound check at the junior high school yeah. wherever you were at. And I mean, your dad didn't even know how he got there. So he might call the school, hey, this is Eddie Van Halen, his well, weasel. I don't, uh, I don't know how check. that happened. I mean, he must have had some uh, conversation or information from my parents uh, about it. But I... I didn't have the ability to influence that kind of decision, you know? Yeah. So. Of course not. That's just, it's incredible. That's, uh, yeah, that would make me want to play guitar forever as well. Like, I mean, that's just. Such it a, was a, totally insane. And I just remember kids uh, freaking out, you know, that they could see that it was Eddie Van Halen and they didn't want to go into their class. And like, because uh, I, I think he was like wandering around asking where, where the auditorium was and where he could find me. And like, so, you know, wow. just imagine something like that. You got to put it into perspective. Now it would be like Justin Bieber walking into a, oh, yeah. you know, an, a, a, an elementary school or, or a junior high and, and asking for somebody and saying, Hey, where can I find I so do and some so. vocal warmups with, uh, with yeah. Diesel. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, people that he was the, most famous guitarist in the world at that time. And oh, yeah. they, they were the biggest band in the world at that time. Eddie mentioned playing Fair Warning for your dad at the house. Do you remember that at all? I remember a couple times they were playing some music. The record that was most recent that he was working on at that time was Diver Down. Okay. And uh, But I know that I had played stuff uh, from Fair Warning for my dad, and so there was probably a, a couple of tracks that – um, I had mentioned to my dad and they, uh, I'm sure they, they would have listened to Mean Street because that, uh, my dad, I think is the one that is credited as the, uh, the person who, who said Edward Van Halen reinvented the electric guitar. Yep. I think that was first uh, a quote from him in an interview. Um, but you know, they talked about different things, uh, different songs, different kinds of music. And, and I think the thing was, at that time, it was very clear that Ed was at the height of his creative power in what he was doing, but he didn't have anything that he could hear as another guitarist that was influencing him in a, in a way, you know, like guitar music wasn't a thing that was really influencing him. He was looking for other things. Maybe the only guitarist that was inspiring to him who was on a different level was Alan Holdsworth. Yeah. And around that same time, he was working with Alan, uh, as well. So that was, uh, well, an, Ed, another Ed, thing. Eddie wrote a lot of, uh, fair warning on piano too at home. Had you heard that? That I did not hear, so it would be interesting to, to know what translated from the piano. I mean, I can hear possibly like uh, Sunday afternoon in the park and... Yeah. Um, well, probably three or four songs because a lot of it, like Mean Street was Voodoo Queen and the demos and they had brought that back. And, right, and a but lot the, of the intro though, that's yeah. the most unique thing. I mean, still hands down, if you hear that and, and you've never seen what it is and you just listen to it, you can't even picture how that's coming out of the guitar or like what's even happening there. Yep. Uh, so the rhythmic pattern, the harmonics, how he came up with that, that would be the, the thing to, you know, that I wish there was a way to just, you know, because the thing is, I know that when he liked something, when he thought something was cool, he was just like anybody else. He would rewind the tape and go, check this out. This part is so cool. Check this out. And so that same kind of thing, that enthusiasm was always there. But when he was writing that, he probably was thinking, this is the coolest thing ever. And he's like, <laughs> record it and listen, play it some more. I mean, I'm sure he had to have been thrilled with what that was because how could you not as a guitar player? I mean, it, it's just, it's it's amazing. And I, I actually heard something um, 
on a, a live concert they did in 1981. It's from Greensboro, North Carolina. I've never heard it on any other version of Mean Street, but he starts doing this extra, when he's doing the tapping pattern, the rhythm pattern at the beginning, he adds another part to it in the live solo that I've never heard anywhere else and it never made an appearance on a record, but it's one of the coolest things that ever happened again. It's like, it's, he took that idea even further and it's this weird little descending part of that tapping thing. And if you, you can find it on the internet, but yeah. I heard it and it was like, it really spoke to me because it's really hearing uh, the advancement of that thing in a way that he never did beyond that. Seeing that also in the live videos of all these concerts that have emerged, which is amazing. Yeah. It's awesome to see. And that's what people look for. You know, you're not listening for this great audio on those things, but you want to hear for different little techniques he might have used in a certain part, if they played something different. Or, or... the spontaneous stuff. Yeah, because, exactly. Because I know from talking with, with Ed about uh, his own playing over the years is he would say, and you can even hear him talk about it in interviews, is that sometimes he would do things that were spontaneous that would trigger something in him where he was like, wow, I don't think I could ever do that again. That's just that thing that happened right then and there. And he, like any musician that is tuned in to what's happening right in the moment, that is the thing that you, you live for. Like to have something happen that, could only happen in a singular moment and an audience that could see that that's unique to them it's that special thing that just it can't be recreated recreated because it just it, it's that one time and place and my dad was the same with improvisational solos that's what he loved was to, just to have the ability to spontaneously compose and make something happen that is unique to that moment in time and will never happen again but it's interesting to, to find those little things in some of those live performances where he'll play a lick that you never hear on a record, but it's right there. He does, he throws something in yeah. and it's always a surprise element and it's, it's amazing. What I get from your father's music is the same thing where he's kind of, you know, he taped all his live shows, right? Yeah. Is that how he would track things? He just liked it was how it was in a live concert well, and he would go back to the studio and try to recreate that then? Well, the thing is, in the the early days of, of the music business, most things were about capturing a live performance. It was about good musicians playing together and the feeling that was created there. And yep. because that's what naturally attracts people to music is, oh, wow, this this thing, it's creating a... A feeling, and I'm I'm into it, or I'm excited by it, and so whether it was in the early days where you'd have like an Elvis session where he'd be the closest person to the mic, and other things that you want to hear in the mix, they get closer or further away. That's how these things were made. It's like you got one mic, and it's capturing what people sound like when they're playing, and when it came to doing something like capturing uh, an artist like Jimi Hendrix or or even Van Halen, as we're talking about, the goal was to be able to capture what it most organically or naturally sounded like. So when you hear a band like Van Halen rip through their songs in the studio, and then you listen to early bootleg performances, it sounds the same. It's It's got a lot of energy there. You know, it's yeah. not like, oh, it's tamed, it's dumbed down, it's more perfected. They just had that raw energy, and and uh, when when we were able to hear that track of eruption uh, with those uh, room mics, and then you hear that they just bust into "You Really Got Me" right after. Yes. Right there, what that's saying is that these guys are just playing this stuff, and they're just firing it out, you know. And the thing is. If it was me, if I had played Eruption like that, I would have stopped and gone into the recording studio and said, I got to hear that. That's the one, <laughs> you know? But they're just like, oh, let's go ahead and play, you know, you really got me now, yeah. you know? Had you heard, or what's your take on Eruption being a solo he was practicing for a show later that night? That he was in here, he was doing a solo he'd working on, and then it came and he did it, you know, it's one take. Yeah, well, it's definitely one take, but uh, he had had a lot of pieces of that solo that had appeared in various different ways. 
But what he did for the version that's on the album is it's it's very much uh, all the the most salient points, all of the the most interesting bits that he could show off his technique, but still make it very musical and have you go on the ride. And that is the difference between the live solos and the studio one. The live solos, he gets to really cut loose and do whatever he wants in the moment. And so there's a lot more playing and it's not necessarily as composed. The Eruption album version has some spontaneous feeling playing, but it's it's more structured so that it's it really takes you from the beginning to the end and you go on a journey through this whole thing. And he never played it that way ever again. There's not a version of him playing a uh, an eruption uh, that has the exact same structure or phrasing. So that really is the, the one unique version yeah. of that. Because in a live show, he never tried to play it note for note like the record. I mean, I've never heard a version of it. He always changed it. When did you uh, start learning it, start the process of learning it? I mean, you do I, great, a great, thanks. great, great version uh, of it. It's all over the internet. Numerous. Yeah, I mean, I tried learning it from the age of 12, but over the years, uh, you know, I, I really kept, you know, working at it and working at it, trying to get not only just the notes, but try to get some of the phrasing and the vibrato and all that stuff because um, – the way I look at it is if you're going to try to play it, you should try your best to see how close you can get to what Ed was doing because you're never going to get exactly right there. But the closer that you can get and know how much work it takes to get there, that shows you just how amazingly gifted Ed was to yeah. be able to just play that. Just play it as it was and the tone and, and everything. Just have that take place the way that it was. If you can get anywhere in the ballpark, even like 85 to 90%, it's going to take you months, if not years of your life to try to get to that. And that's now and this year. Imagine 35 years ago when people were trying to learn it and all you have is the album. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's mind blowing. It's impossible. Yeah. yeah, but the beauty of it is that it it shows you the exact blueprint for how to make music, but yet you're showing off the technical expertise in a composition. You know, if you were going to hear a violin concerto, you'd be hearing years of somebody's, you know, practicing and they're playing this piece of music that they're reading and and that's a skill in and of itself to be able to play you know, Paganini or Bach or whatever and read it off the page and play this amazing stuff, right? But Ed wrote this thing. Nothing had been done like that before. He had a unique sound and the way that he played, his phrasing, his vibrato, all of that stuff, that's as important as the notes, the sound and the phrasing and the vibrato. So if you're going to learn it, I feel like all those elements have to be taken into consideration to to be able to even be close to saying that you can play it the way that he played it. If you're just going to disregard some of those things, it's not the same to me. This you is know? my take on it kind of thing, right? Yeah, and that's a valid thing to to say, well, I'm going to do my own version, whatever. It's not as much of an interest to me when it comes to trying to replicate one of the most important guitar things that ever <laughs> happened. Like Just to say, oh, I'm doing my own thing. Yeah, great, that's cool, I get that. But can you do what he did? Nobody can. Yeah. You know? You had uh, three great, great, huge, magnificent guitar people in your life that were sitting in that room, Steve Vai, Frank Zappa, and Eddie Van Halen. Uh, just saying that is incredible. What did each one kind of contribute to your songwriting and guitar playing? Well, in my own world of of trying to process all of that information and those influences... Growing up, I would see my dad play and I would see how he conducted the band. I and mean, he literally would conduct like an orchestra, you know, conductor uh, at times. Uh, but he had this, uh, uh, he 
he had the vocabulary of a composer. He knew all the colors and textures that were needed to make music come alive in different ways. And he could write it out and he could hand something to somebody and they would have to play it. And Steve Vai was one of those guys that could be handed a piece of paper and he would work on that and be able to play it. And it was like a magic trick to see these people read this stuff and play hard stuff. And they would they would rehearse sometimes three or four months for a, a tour that might only have 40 shows or less. Oh, yeah. You know, and the point was my dad wanted them to be bulletproof. He wanted them to play this stuff and and have every performance be as good as it could possibly be because the people that were paying money to see this, they wanted to see something that was special, something unique to them. So nobody was going in there and phoning this in. You had to really work hard to do that. So Van Halen's on the same level as that because they didn't phone it in. They're running around and they're making that show come alive and the lights and all that kind of stuff. They're super athletic, yet at the same time playing hardcore musicianship, you know, stuff that is is very difficult to play, but natural to them because they're the writers of it. They're expressing themselves doing it. So Steve Vai and my dad's band, learning all that hard stuff, I could see it. I could, I could see how the parts that he was playing were done. I could hear the music that I wanted to eventually learn. I could watch Eddie Van Halen play up close. I could see him on stage and I could think, I would love to be able to make music that could deliver that kind of energy. But, you know, in my own way, over a period of a lifetime, little bits would filter through to to where I finally could have what my own voice would be in this. So I would learn things and I would try to play things as close to the way that I heard it as I could. But eventually the goal was to be able to have my own vocabulary and be able to make things that would make that that could deliver some of the thoughts and feelings in my head but the thing is some people have that that is formed so much earlier than others like for me it took a really long time before i felt like i actually had what my own voice is on the guitar or as a musician to graduate from being a guitar player to a musician to be able to work with people and understand the language of music i mean that took you know, 30 plus years. Yeah. But Edward Van Halen was fully formed by the time the debut album was there. They had written most of the material that would be on the next five albums. Sure. Right? So he was fully formed at that point with his his vocabulary, his technique, his sound, his songwriting, and it just kept growing from there, you know? So that was amazing to see that he had done it so early. That's so alien you know, it really is. And Steve Vai's playing uh, at that time was more in context to my dad's music. And I would see him play what my dad would call stunt guitar, impossible guitar parts, where he was learning the hardest bits of my dad's music that wasn't written for guitar, but he was playing it on guitar. So that was something that I was really in tune to with Steve's playing. So later on, when he was, you know, playing in other bands and eventually playing with David Lee Roth, that style of his playing, that was that was now more of what was flowing through him naturally as opposed to him having to work so hard to learn this music that you had to really be so focused on. He, he was able to actually relax a bit more in his own music, yeah. but he had all this technical facility and it would come out. So that was something I always knew about in his playing and I always appreciated it. But in the really formative years of my playing, it was uh, the the biggest influences were, you know, Edward Van Halen, Randy Rhodes, my dad, Angus Young, and also uh, Jimi Hendrix and Jimmy Page, you know. So it was like that group of all those those people. And of course, uh, also got to say Brian May and yeah. uh, and even... Uh, Jeff you know, Beck? Well, Jeff Beck, yeah. I mean, Jeff Beck in... in as as the years went on, he started to climb the ranks to be like, okay, this is the guy that is all about the musical aspect, the phrasing, like the vocal quality of the guitar and doing stuff that takes it out of the context of anything having to do with guitar hero. It's more just about like making the guitar speak. That's that's his voice that he's he's using. So I love all these aspects of guitar, but if I want to just be 
excited about just the raw energy of like the superpower that rock can bring, just put on Unchained, you know, like the, and thinking about seeing that in a live show and the lights and Dave jumping off the drum riser and the electric atmosphere of everybody in the room at that moment, like just, you can't help but be so psyched to see what you're seeing, you know? It was incredible. Where was the first time you saw Van Halen at the Forum? The first time I saw them play live was on the Diver Down tour, and it was at the Forum. And, I mean, it was the craziest, coolest thing. I I probably couldn't really sleep for, like, two weeks <laughs> because I was so energized by this. Uh, it, and I, I know that that's how everybody was feeling when they would see these shows. Sure. Yeah, and in today's environment, that just wouldn't happen. You no, know, I mean... Barely, he, at the forum today, when I just saw Tool, which actually Eddie was sitting right by me, um, at the, oh, that was at the Staples Center. Um, people just stand there, and they don't even hardly clap a little bit, and it's kind of... Your dad had a great watch, saying... They watch through their phone. You yes, know? that's so insane. Yeah, the excitement is... it. Do you think because we're so overexposed with so much stuff going on that music... What's the saying that your dad said about wallpaper? Oh, um, it's music the has ever. become a uh, wallpaper for people's lifestyle. And that's no, no more true than it is right now. It really is crazy just because what that represents is that people look for something that can be on in the background, but that will indicate who they are as a person. It says, oh, I'm the person that likes this kind of thing, so you can think of me in this box. Yep. You know, critical thinking and people who think outside the box – has become more rare. Yes. Uh, but a guy like Eddie Van Halen, he was outside the box when he was thinking about the sound and the playing and all the things that he was doing. And I think he always stayed on, on that kind of path. And the same as my dad was, he did what he liked, and if other people liked it, that was a bonus. Yeah, he's, you know? Frank would always say that too. You know, It's like, this is yeah. my music, but if you like it, that's cool too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's, that's the That's the attitude thing. we should all take in everything we do. You know, live your own life. Don't do something, especially with musicians. You know, I see everybody trying to mimic other people that are on top right now. Like, but that's always been there, and it will always be a thing because, in, in a sense, everybody is standing on the shoulders of somebody else because if you like something and it inspires you to do it, you're going to learn what you can about that, and you're going to have your filter is going to go through... I want to do something that's kind of like this because this is what makes me excited about it. And so it starts in the the early stages of anybody's career. They're going to have influences that that show up. But at a certain point now, uh, when your influences are things that are, are showing up, but it's it's now not even the first version. So like for example, like uh, Lenny Kravitz, he's great. He's great at what he does. He's clearly inspired by 70s rock and, and funk and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're going to hear some of those influences come out in the sound of his records, and you're going to hear that in, in what he does. He does it his own way, but yet you can hear Hendrix. You can hear Zeppelin. You can hear the Beatles. You can hear these things. So those influences, if somebody is a young artist coming up today and they've never heard those but they've heard Lenny Kravitz, they're going to think, oh, I like that style of Lenny Kravitz. But Lenny Kravitz is the amalgamation of all those things that came before that that new person doesn't know anything about. So that's it's almost the same as like when Van Halen did You Really Got Me. When I heard that, I was like, this is the coolest song. But when I heard the Kinks version, I'm like, oh, man, they can't play that Van Halen song for shit. <laughs> you know. But then, of course, I come to find out that it's, you know, I'm 12. I didn't know that the yeah. Kinks existed, you know, so... But when you find that out and then you hear it later on and you hear like the, the, the cool elements of the original and you hear it for what it is and you go, oh, wow, it's cool that Van Halen took it to this place from here. That's the thing is music appreciation is kind of a lost art and you, you need to have yeah. a, a reference point for all this stuff. So I get it when, yes, everybody should ultimately do their own thing, but it's very easy to be inspired by things that are super cool that you love and do a thing that, that, that you do. It's just a, it's how it ends up coming together at the end of the day, the execution of it that makes a difference to the listener. Yeah, I think there's a, a big leap, though, from some people being inspired to almost 
not just in music, but in our social media environment where it's just they plagiarize what they see and what's popular, what has a million hits on it. Okay, that's how I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to dress. That's what I'm going to play. That's what I'm going to sound like because that's good and that's popular right now. And that's even what the record industries do. You know, they just try to recreate it's the same recipe. It's always been that way, though. Yeah, I mean, it's like you can see it all the way back to the 50s, 60s, whatever. You know, I mean, there's always been these these little you know, hit factory type of ideas. I remember uh, when I was first playing and having meetings to like uh, meet with record companies when I was about 17. Oh, wow. So there, was a, there was a guy that was, um, there used to be a magazine, it, mi- it might still exist, called Music Connection Magazine. Sure. And they used to have a thing called Anatomy of a Hit. And it would tell you why the song was liked by the audience and it would tell you the tempo and it would tell you what key it was in and what chord progression was in it. And so a lot of these A&R guys would have stacks of this Music Connection magazine and they'd look at those things and they, whatever came in, they'd listen to a song and then they'd like look at anatomy of a hit and be like, oh, I wonder if it's got the same tempo as this. And so you would start to hear these A&R guys who really had no real skill at all yeah. uh, start making comments like, they play 20 seconds of a song, you know, and go, yeah, great <laughs> tempo. As if tempo has anything to do with it, yeah. you know? And so <laughs> it, it was these kinds of moments where I started to get really uh, freaked out that, that it really didn't matter. Like the skill that you were working on was lost on, on people. And then my dad told me, he said, you know, the music industry is – is depressing, you know, because there's always a, a huge amount of compromises. So unless you can do it completely on your own, you're just going to be disappointed. And yep. it's not about skill or talent. It's especially in the eighties, it became just about what people look like, you know? So a band like super tramp, they had a huge, you know, a bunch of songs in the early eighties. But by the time, uh, MTV came around, they didn't exist anymore because that wasn't uh, the the look that uh, you know MTV was was going for. Sure. You know, well, Devo that was like Warner Brothers act that they had pushed right before Van Halen. Yeah, that was a giant album they did. I wanted to talk to you about that. Templeman was so instrumental, and I I think he was the reason they did all these covers because he knew that that would get radio play for them. Would you agree with that? It's probably something that was the. The idea at the time was uh, it had worked so many times before with other artists, and when they did do their covers, they did get on the radio and they did uh, reach people. But there's other things that are involved in how things get on the radio, and you know, without getting too deep into it, everybody has probably heard of payola and all those things. Sure. So. Uh, some bands had to rely heavily on that. And I don't know if that was ever the case really for Van Halen because they were a big touring act and they could sell a lot of tickets. You know, once people saw that band, they yeah. were in. They, but that being said, early on, there's there are tapes where Ed's playing Eruption. And I think the earliest one I heard was around 1975 or something. Didn't have all the tapping stuff in it at that point. But he's playing amazing guitar and yet there's a couple of people in the room that just give it a golf clap. <laughs> that like he plays this incredible stuff and that's all you hear like woo. And so everything starts somewhere is my point. If if you do something and people catch fire with it and they they tell their friends, that's how this stuff really kind of gets going. In that time period and you would have been a young kid, but do you remember some other bands that you were really like hard rock bands, metal groups that were anywhere similar to Van Halen? That well, you were the listening thing was, to? you know, when Van Halen came out, I was too young to be paying attention to exactly what had happened yeah. on their rise. I really became aware of them when I was twelve, and it was already nineteen eighty-two at that point. You okay. know, but but the thing about um, Van Halen in context to other bands they definitely were different than what was popular at the time because disco was a big thing and a punk. lot of like rock stuff was on its way out or passe. You know, people were thinking, oh, punk is the new thing. But punk didn't sell a lot of albums per se. It did influence an attitude in music. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it wasn't like, 
you know, the equivalent of, you know, a major pop breakthrough punk rock. And Van Halen had some punk rock elements in their, their playing in terms of attitude, in terms of energy and just, you know, digging in with aggression. Uh, so, but four headed monster. I mean, it was just every you, part of it. Yeah. But if you really think of them compared to disco, <laughs> that's, that's the amazing thing is that they broke through and that they made that, uh, you know, an audience really found that. But you had other bands that were also like rock, but had good um, melodic songwriting things like Cheap Trick, you know? So that was around the same time yeah. um, as, as Van Halen. So there was a thing there where people were, they still liked the power of guitar. Um, and I think probably a lot of bands, when Van Halen came out, they were like, what are we going to do? This guy's too good. You know, like, how are we going to compete with what that is? We can't do that. Yeah. You know? 100%. What did uh, Frank say about Van Halen? Had he said anything about him when you initially started playing the records around the house? I'm sure you had a guitar and you're, you know, playing Running with the Devil. And what was his uh, reaction to it? That He really liked the sound of the record and he liked the guitar playing. Uh, the, the few songs that I would play him, like uh, particularly Mean Street and... I loved the solo on Push Comes to Shove on oh, Fair yeah. Warning, and I played him that solo, and he just really loved what Ed was doing there because it it sounded like a guitar, but it didn't really sound like a guitar, particularly on that one because he had all these harmonics and other things that he was doing and his phrasing and the tone that he had there. It was, you can, I mean, that is just an amazing performance, and the tone of it is is what is so amazing too. And I'd love to uh, find out from Ted or Don, you know, really what was going on when they, how they were using the Eventide harmonizer at that point, and some of the things that they were doing that gave that the depth that it had because it it's so good. All right, I want to try something different here. Let's go through Fair Warning and tell me the first word that comes. To your mind, okay. When you hear the title of the song. All right. Mean Street. Greatest guitar sound ever. Dirty Movies. First drop D riff on a Van Halen record. Sinner Swing. Unbelievable feel, and the solo is Berserk. <laughs> hear, hear about it later. This one is. I. I it stands out in so many ways, but the flanger is, uh, it's a clean flanger, and then he's got uh, an amazing solo in that it's, that shows off new techniques. Unchained. Best drop D riff of all time. Nice. So this is love. The solo on this is the blues, but not the blues you've ever heard before, and it's got a really cool chromatic thing. And I don't know what guitar he played. I feel like it had to have been like a uh, 335 or something different. Sunday afternoon in the park. First time Alex Van Halen is showcased where this is like an Alex Van Halen solo. Yes. Uh, and the, the, the triggering of the filters of the synthesizer with the kick drum was genius. One foot out the door. This is a song with two of the best Van Halen guitar solos in it, best guitar sound, but the 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 song is perplexing to me. I don't the riff, there's no actual guitar riff. It's a keyboard thing and it's it's like a story of hearing Dave getting in trouble and having to jump out the window, you know? So it's like <laughs> th it, this is a, a it's a crazy song, but I feel like it probably was meant for something else. It feels like movie soundtrack music to me. Yes. But the solo, he does something in the solo, and I, I, I plan to learn the solo uh, at some point soon because there's a lick in there that I have no idea what it is, and I have to figure out what it is because for years I've never understood what he was doing, but I have to, I have to learn it one of these days. <laughs> Why do you think it wasn't such an Im immediate hit? Because it was uh, different? Well, I mean, that's, themes, that's the folklore. Everybody, tunings. everybody's saying that it wasn't as popular when it first came out. I'm sure the tour did fine. Uh, there was nothing that would have stopped an audience from enjoying any of that music live. It went on to sell really well. Maybe it wasn't as uh, party atmosphere 
you know, the attitude that Van Halen gave off was that they were the ultimate party band and they could come into town and, you know, everybody was going to be super excited because this is going to be a good time. But this record had some dark sounds on it. It, it, The tone of the record changed. uh, And, but I think uh, for, for me, that was the, the apex of the creativity of the band and the the sonic character of that record is what I wanted to hear more and more of. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, it goes down in history as, as being similar to what I just described. A lot of people really enjoy it for those reasons because um, it, it was the growth of a band right there. They really were doing something that was a little different and I think maybe that was also... Uh, some people have said that was the closest to a Van Halen solo album or or Ed really being in charge of of the band for the first time. Had you heard that he had came in here at nighttime? Doug Messenger told us uh, that he stopped by in the fair warning session and during the tracking of Unchained that there was a big fight. Eddie stormed out, Ted stormed out, and then Eddie came back with Don that night and retracked. Uh, the guitar and Unchained, and Ted never knew about it. Had you heard that? I've heard of stories of that, and I was assuming it would have been like overdubs um, or textural things, but I don't know. It would be great to know what happened. But see, like anybody being in a studio and hearing a song like, hey, we're going to play a song. What's this one called? Oh, Unchained. Like playing that for the first time and hearing that, it's... That is just like the coolest riff. The first couple of seconds when it comes on, I will never not get super psyched to just, you know, be energized by the power of that riff and that guitar sound and the flanger and and all this stuff. But seeing it with thousands of people, when they either start a show with it or it's an encore thing, it was at a certain point, they must have been able to start thinking about how are people going to react to this music? Uh-huh. They, they started to write with this anthemic idea in mind uh, because they ha- their experience was if they played something, an audience was going to react. So these kind of riffs, and that, that has that pre-chorus in it with that three against four feel that is so incredible, and it's it's such a unique Van Halen thing. Probably the weirdest thing in any of their songs is that pre-chorus section but it's so cool and the fact that you know they just they played it and it was just another song to them so think about something like that and think okay you're an artist and you have a chance to write just one song that can have an impact like that just one out of everything you ever do one just kind of hits with people but that's just one thing in a huge sea of stuff that he did that like changed how people felt guitar or wanted to play guitar. And that's what's so cool. And to me, again, that right there, he had taken it to the very height of his creative powers. The push comes to shove solo, the best solo that he ever did for me. Yeah, there's so many more added elements on that album where there's like funk and kind of like some bossa nova stuff some places and even, you know, the swing on the drums. I think that's kind of where they really realized that they could do this on their own maybe and started being super inventive. Ed's writing a bunch. Ted's probably, we need to do more hits. We need to do more hits. You know, let's do another cover. Do you think that was kind of going on in this room that day? Well, I mean, the thing is, it's all about perspective. If he's, if he's reporting to the label and the label is only interested in having hits, that's going to be his, his mantra. He's going to have to be like, okay, we got to, try and do this thing. And so then the next record had some cover songs on it. Yeah. Uh, so. You know, I'm glad Ed won, I feel like, on that. Well, yeah, I think we all are. But here's the thing. There has to be outtakes from stuff. And if I could hear any outtakes, I would want to hear stuff from Fair Warning. And I know there was an alternate version of Hear About It Later that had a different section in it that never made it to a record because I talked with Ed about it. And there was this really cool riff uh, that 
was introduced. You know how it has the breakdown section uh, for the solo uh -huh. uh, and the cowbell and all that stuff? Yeah. There was a different riff that happened oh, wow. there. And then Ed did this other solo that was like very Alan Holdsworth inspired. It, it kind of had some stuff where he just took it a little outside. And that might have been one of the things that maybe they were coming back in and doing late at night and um, maybe didn't get a chance to make make it to the record because maybe everyone was like, ah, I don't know, that's, that's taking it a little too far outside. Uh, but that, that's what I want to hear. I yeah. want to hear, you know, something from that era.